The Minnesota Twins lost Thursday's game, Kenta Maeda, at least for one day, and the series to the Boston Red Sox 2-1 thanks to an 11-5 blowout loss at Fenway Park on Thursday afternoon. What's next for the Twins? What's next for Kenta? Are there moves that come in round the bend? All this and more will be answered on today's episode of Locked On Twins. So sit back, buckle up, and get comfortable because Locked On Twins starts now. You are Locked On Twins. Your daily Minnesota Twins podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hey, hey, what do you say? Thanks for making Locked On Twins your first listen today. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. That includes Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, uh, Spotify is my personal favorite, but you can check us out there or on YouTube if you're watching this on the video. Uh, obviously, great to see you and and uh, enjoy you being here. Uh, and of course, we're on the Locked On Podcast Network, which is your team every day. As a reminder, too, hang out in the comment section on YouTube. We love to chat ball with you. Or if you are listening on a podcast app, give us a five-star review if you like the show. If you don't, please feel free to send me messages, Twitter, however, and let me know what I can do to better serve you. If you have questions that you want to get answered on the show, too, we would love to do that. We'd love to chop it up with you on the show. So send those to me on Twitter or at Locked On Twins. You can just send a direct message or just a straight up mention. That's that's fine. We'd love to answer questions and hear what's on your mind, too. And also, after games, we've been doing a Locked On Twins breathless post-game minute where basically I prattle and rattle on for up to a minute on the quick for a quick recap of that day's action. And um, so I say breathless because I try to get a lot of information into that minute. And um, by the time I'm done, I'm pretty winded. Now, too, if there's enough interest, we can do pregame ones, too. So we'll see what that looks like, you know, break down the lineup, pitching matchup, that sort of thing. And again, all in one minute. So, um, you know, we'll keep that in mind. But check out Locked on Twins, Breathless Postgame Minute. Just as soon as we can get it up there after the game, it will show up on YouTube. Just, uh, again, be sure to check that out. Now, let's dive right in. Before we get started, the Twins will play the Nationals at 7 10 p.m. on Friday at Target Field. You got Tyler Malley against Trevor Williams. And if you want to catch every single pitch from the Twins' hometown broadcast on the Sirius XM app, that's the SXM app, if you search Twins, you can find every single game on your hometown broadcast. That's the SXM app, Sirius XM, and look for Twins. So the Twins take one of two to close out the Red Sox series. They win game two. 10 to 4, and then lose game three, 11 to 5. So after a one run loss in the opener, both teams take a blowout win to the rest of the way of the series with uh, with Boston taking two of three. Let's first talk about Wednesday. Obviously, a big win for the Twins. Also, Joe Ryan going six innings, teaming up with Brent Hedrick in his first MLB out and getting a three inning save. I believe he became the third twin in history to start their career with a three inning save. And I believe the most recent was Michael Nakamura back in 2003, so 20 years ago, which is uh, which is very impressive. Um, again, homers from Joey Gallo, uh, Trevor Larnick, and Ed Julien. Um, Corey Kluber was absolutely dreadful. Had uh, no velocity, secondary stuff wasn't fooling anybody, and he just he looked like a shell of his former self, which I think. A lot of people had hoped would be the case with Chris Sale the night before. It wasn't. Um, and, yeah, so Kluber was the one the Twins actually handled well as, uh, as Tanner Houck was really good in Thursday's game. But we'll we'll get to that in a second. Um, Twins four for eight with runners in scoring position on Wednesday, which is, again, a step forward from the last few games where they were really struggling, struggling excuse me, to push runs across. Um Joe Ryan, six innings, six strong innings. He becomes the first twin starter since Brad Radke to start a season four and oh. So we're going back into the time capsule just a little bit there. And, and only six strikeouts for this offense in game two of the series, the Corey Kluber game. Um, we have just seen way too many times this season that the twins have struck out 10 plus times in a game. In fact, with Thursday afternoon's game of 10 strikeouts, the twins now 
have struck out 10 plus times in an AL high 10 games. And all of those have come on the tail of facing Sandy Alcantara in Miami. So all of these have been really bunched together and it's been pretty evident that this twins team is just, is not capable of making consistent contact right now. So right back at it again with Thursday's game, but, um, but it's hard not to be, you, you can be encouraged by, by Wednesday's game, um, you know, 10, four win looked like they had a chance to, to take the series here. Uh, Eddie Julien with, uh, again, his second big league Homer, uh, Joey Gallo coming back was a huge lift for this offense. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see as guys kind of start filtering back into this lineup. sounds like Jorge Polanco is extremely close. Um, Alex Kirilov, not that far behind. Um, as this lineup starts to stack up again, that's the one place the Twins have really struggled so far this season. And if they can get that lineup back firing even 75% with the way this staff is pitched, th- they're going to be in a good spot to win most nights. Um, so game, game two, uh, the Thursday matinee was basically the direct opposite for, uh, for the twins dropping an 11 and five decision. Uh, Kent Maeda leaves the game after the second inning, Jaron Duran, uh, absolutely pasted a ball that hit Kenta on the ankle, uh, kicks off to the side. He managed to basically by, by sheer adrenaline, make the play to end the inning, but, um, he couldn't come back out for the third. And that's where things kind of went sideways. Maeda had given up a homer, but Emilio Pagan came in and was just absolutely crushed. Um, ended up giving up eight hits, six earned runs. His ERA is just under eight. People are calling for him to be DFA'd, and at, at this point, you really can't argue with them. Um, but yeah, beyond that, you know, the Twins just didn't really have it in this one after Kenta got knocked out, uh, especially with Hedrick working the night before. They kind of had to piece it together with the rest of the way. And I think they probably would have rather had Emilio Pagan throw more innings. He threw, let's see here, um, 50, no, 42 pitches, 31 strikes. So he was around the zone. Obviously he was getting hit hard. I think they would have probably rather he got 42 pitches for a lot more than just five outs. But again, um, such is life. Uh, Jorge Alcala giving him two and a third. I think the biggest thing here with three relievers, each throwing 40 pitches on Thursday is that there's going to be a lot of turnover on this pitching staff in terms of moves probably announced before Friday's game. Um, Yeah, Pagan was horrible. Hovani Moran, really, really rough series. Two games where he just looked completely out of sorts, including allowing the Red Sox to walk the Twins off in the opener. Um, Max Kepler, two for five, starting to swing and look a little better at the plate. But – and, and it's hard to say how much this matters, but he made the last out at third base. Now, it was on uh, a ball just dumped into the outfield where the ball came back in. And whatever miscommunication there was between him and Tommy Watkins resulted in Kepler being thrown out going back to third. Um, to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. If you are down six runs at the time, hold the guy up, go station to station and wait for that big homer or a uh, hit to the gap. There just There was no incentive to just – not just stop him all the way there. So um, hard for me to feel like one or the other is 100% culpable, but that's how it ends. Uh, Twins would have had the bases loaded with two outs. So again, not like the tying run would have been up or anything, but certainly a frustrating way to see a game. And and yeah, 10 strikeouts, that's 10 times this season they've done that. Um, Third in MLB or tied for third in MLB, but first in the American League. And I don't know if this will qualify as good news or bad news. I think it's either or. Uh, the Twins won't see the Red Sox again for a couple months here. It'll be June 19th to the 22nd. There'll be a four-gamer at Target Field. Um, I am not particularly a big believer in this Red Sox team, so I would rather play them again soon. Um, but we'll see. Uh, you know, it's um, it's a it's a Red Sox team that is clearly in transition, but I know some of the fans have been encouraged by how they uh, fared, especially especially on Thursday, where this team could be quote unquote back. Um, I'm I'm not as convinced. Uh, let's talk about Built Bars for just a split second here. If you have a if you haven't tried those, you really really have to get on that. Um, there is something exciting though coming to Built.com on April 22nd, so just around the corner. We don't have all the details yet, but the excitement is real, and we don't want you to miss it. 
Now, if you know how Built works, they have the most incredible protein bars in the world. They taste like candy bars, and they have these amazing flavor drops with unreal flavors, but in limited quantities. So mark your calendars and head to Built.com on Saturday, April 22nd, to be one of the first to discover what the hype is all about. I can't wait to see what the new flavor is, and I will be making sure that you all use the promo code LOCKEDON15 to get 15% off your first order. Again, that's Built.com, promo code LOCKEDON15. Before we dive into the second segment, uh, thanks for making the Twins, uh, Locked On Twins, your first listen every day. And if you're an everydayer, you will swing back in, hopefully, on Friday for us to wrap up the week, get you amped for the Twins taking on a 5-13 and 13 Nationals team. Um, so we're going to work on that as we head into the weekend. Uh, big homestand starting, week and a half long, which is going to be good. It always seems to cure what ails you. Um, Twins and Nationals open up Friday night at Target Field, 7.10 p.m. first pitch. Tyler Malley and Trevor Williams, you can get that on SiriusXM on the SXM app. All you got to do, search for Twins, and it'll take you right there to the hometown call. One move happened on Thursday that it really doesn't affect the Twins, but I still feel as though it might be pertinent to talk about for just a second. Madison Bumgarner was designated for assignment by the Arizona Diamondbacks with something like $37 million left on his contract. And I think it just goes to show that a lot of times fans can have a pretty rough, and I don't mean rough in terms, I mean rough in terms of bad perception of what pitchers would be worth targeting in free agency. Now, a lot of us wanted the Twins to sign Zach Wheeler. They ended up with Josh Donaldson after Wheeler rebuffed them, wouldn't, you know, he went where he wanted to go. Um, but before that, or around that time frame, the Twins fans, the Twins faithful wanted Madison Bumgarner. They wanted Jake Arrieta before that. And the, uh, there's one other spectacular flame. Basically, what I'm saying, though, is it just seems as though, oh, Dallas Keuchel, that's the other one. Um, the way that Twins fans want to attack pitching in the, the um, offseason is not, <laughs> I, I think I think it should result in more accountability from fans being like, oh, yeah, you know, I was wrong. Now I understand why they do things the way they do. Or what, I understand why they're not as Sola on the postseason hero in his 30s who throws 88 as I am. Um, you know, the moves the Twins have made recently have not been a, a big, uh, you know, big forays into free agency. It's been big trades. But I just think, too, it's it's not bad to kind of reassess and take stock of takes we had in the past and learn from them. So if people were upset that the Twins weren't signing the over-the-hill starters who had previously been good, um, Things would look a lot different if they had, let's just say. So, um, yeah, I mean, Madison Bumgarner, DFA, he's going to end up somewhere else. My money is on the White Sox or the Red Sox. Uh, I did see people say, though, the Cardinals could be an interesting fit. Um, but I, a lot of people are saying, too, if Brent Strom can't keep you rolling, that's their pitching coach, came over from Houston. Um, if he can't keep you up and rolling, it's pretty much done. So, um yeah, I didn't mean to talk that much about Bumgarner on a Twins podcast, but just thought it'd be fun to kind of take a trip down memory lane. Um, but though, speaking of DFAs, uh, we're all wondering now if it's time to DFA Emilio Pagan, right? I mean, we if you were the most ardent supporter of Pagan, which I don't even know how that could exist, um, you know, this kind of just had to be it. It was basically like, and I actually posted this on Twitter, the gif of Bugs Bunny pitching to the gas house gorillas back in the super old cartoon baseball bugs. And they're doing a conga line around the bases. And that's, that's pretty much what the Red Sox are doing to Emilio Pagan today. Um, at this point you could DFA him. And I think due to his salary, he might even clear waivers. That's how ugly it's been. The question becomes, do you want to send him to St. Paul to work things out? Which I don't see why not. Maybe he doesn't work things out, but there's no point in just straight up cutting him and eating the money 
if you can send him out and he accepts the assignment. So I just don't think it's going to be a, a, you know, DFA where somebody offers you something decent to trade for him, even a, you know, a C plus prospect and high A ball or something like that. Um, but I think it's time. I do. I, I, I've gotten a lot of grief for quote unquote defending Emilio Pagan. And it was more about the skill set. A guy who throws in the mid 90s, has good secondary stuff, has especially good command. But at the end of the day, it's either right down the middle or a ball. And there's no in between for a pitcher like that. And that's why he has almost an entire career with nearly two home runs per nine innings. I mean, that's just not, that's not a big league pitcher, whether you can. Uh, throw a ball through a cement wall or not. And uh, I think it's time to start making that realization that even if Pagan, for instance, goes to Tampa Bay and they reinvent him, they change his pitch mix, they do something, sometimes those changes of scenery just needed to happen. And I hope Twins fans can be understanding of that if that's what happens with Pagan, because there's not a single fan out there who hasn't pulled out at least um had a few gray hairs uh, put up you know from from watching him pitch to the point where they're like this might be better off without him and so um yeah i i just i think it's time i i think it's the it's run its course he did there were people who wanted him to work the moran situation the other night and then you see how he handled this and it might have been even worse than moran handled it and if you can't trust pagan in a 1-0 game starting in the third inning and you need to soak up some innings, there's no place for him on this roster right now. You can go down. And I think what's going to happen is I think Brent Hedrick will get sent out. Uh, not fair at all because he was very solid in his uh, his big league debut, but they can't have all these guys who they're not going to use in even semi-leverage situations. So I think they send him out um, and maybe bring back Josh Winder, who seems to be – pun intended, winding down his rehab stint with St. Paul. Um, you could add Brock Stewart to the 40-man roster, whether that means DFAing Kyle Garlick again, which I don't think would be the case. It would probably be uh, Trevor McGill, who has just an insanely bad, insanely bad numbers at St. Paul so far. Obviously, it's early, but walks and walks and walks and walks. He's been um, just absolutely dreadful down there. So I think you could DFA, DFA, excuse me, easy for me to say. I think you could DFA him and clear him through waivers pretty easily. Or if he's claimed, um, you know, you probably wouldn't consider that big of a loss. Um, Kenta came out of imaging without a broken ankle, which is obviously a huge deal given he couldn't put that much weight on it on his way off the field. But does that mean he's going to avoid um, the injured list because he, he did go something like seven, eight, nine, something like that days between his last two starts. And Rocco did mention post game that they may start to give starters a little extra rest. If it makes sense, it could make sense for Bailey Ober to make Kenta's next start. Cause I believe it would be lined up. And at that point, you know, you put Kenta on the IL he's made a few starts. He's had some time off kind of getting a feel for where his body's at. Um, so I don't think that extra rest would hurt anything. I mean, I, I thought it wouldn't hurt anything today, too, and then he gets hit by a line drive. But um, that's not really part, part of the deal here. Uh, I, I think just giving him extra rest between every second or third start makes sense because you have enough guys who are big league ready you can swap in. Your Louis Varlins, your Simeon Woods Richardsons. Um, you could have a, a bullpen game starting with Josh Winder. Brock Stewart is another guy who has been absolutely brilliant down at AAA St. Paul. He's striking everybody out. Um I wouldn't be shocked. Well, yeah, if they if they DFA'd McGill, added Stewart, then maybe like sent out Hedrick, brought back. Well, at this point, you, you'd need somebody who could give you some innings. Uh, maybe Cole Sands is ready to come back. I don't know how the, the timing on that is right now. But will they bite the bullet and DFA Emilio Pagan is the question. And I I just don't know. I don't know. If they will, I don't know why they won't at this point. Just because at this, it was a full season and it's bleeding into this season. That's long enough. It's long enough to do something different. Um, but yeah, so we'll see. I, I would imagine Ober's up at some point. The roster situation is going to be pretty fluid with Polanco hopefully coming back here sometime this weekend, maybe as soon as Friday. Um, 
Kirilov played right for St. Paul on Thursday night, uh, but he has not played back-to-back games as yet. So he's probably a little further off, which means that the roster bingo or the roster uh, hot potato is going to be, um, you know, we'll juggle it a little bit longer here because guys aren't going to be quite ready. Um, Willie Castro could be an option. Eddie Julien as an option to go out. Um, I would say Julien probably just based on versatility. They like Castro. I won't say they like him, but they like that he can stand at a bunch of different positions. Um, but let's let's say – oh, and these moves, I suspect, won't come in until tomorrow. Um, you know, they're going to want to see how Jorge Polanco feels tomorrow before making a formal move. Um, maybe that's the same deal with Winder, whatever. But as the roster, you know, knock on wood, starts to come back into focus as far as the best 26 players – for what the team needs at any given moment, um, it could get crowded. And I'm two different names that I've heard people say things like, oh, I wonder if he's going to be here much longer. Oh, I wonder if they DFA this guy. Um, you obviously hear a lot about Max Kepler right now just because it's been a disastrous start. But also Nick Gordon was four for, I want to say four for 44 coming into today's game. He ended up picking up a hit, something like five for 46 now. Um I don't think he's in any danger. I think he's still, you know, he plays enough positions. They still are going to believe enough in his talent or his numbers from last year being indicative of his talent. So I don't, I don't think Gordon's in any danger. Kepler though, I really just don't know because all off season there's, there's trade rumors about him uh, end up. They end up acquiescing on those, not trading him. He's part of a semi crowded group with Gallo and Larnick and, you know, during spring, we we're hoping Kirilov would be healthy, and and we didn't know if Buxton was going to play the outfield. Michael A. Taylor in that mix, um, but as this all kind of filters in, is Max Kepler in danger of losing his roster spot? And part of me is like, well, would they eat that money? I don't think so. But if they DFA him and nobody trades for him, do you eat it? There's just there's too many different things where I'm like. Yeah, I don't think they would do it, but if if the situation got to the point where it was what was best for the team, I'm I'm still not sure they would DFA Kepler. I just I'm not. I want to have that confidence. I want to have that belief first of all that they'll get to that level of health, which seems pretty far-fetched right now. But um ultimately no, I don't think Max Kepler and Nick Gordon are in any sort of danger in losing their roster spots. Um, Even if everybody gets healthy, I feel like there are enough guys with options that they'll make that work. Also too, the more you worry about roster spots in the future, the less it matters because you find out that, Oh, somebody rolls an ankle and needs some time off or gets hit by a pitch or, or whatever. I mean, we haven't even talked about Kyle Farmer yet and he's got a roster spot that would have to be accounted for too. So We'll see what happens. Um, take it day by day and really not fret about it too much because if you don't, it's like Minnesota weather. If you don't like it today, just wait until tomorrow. Um, let's talk about eBay Motors, another fun sponsor of ours. If you are a championship team, you know that it's all about making sure that every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part has to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, make sure you head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to My Garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or you get your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million, let that sink in, 122 million Parts to choose from. You'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. So get the right parts, get the right fit, and get the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. Those are eligible items only and exclusions do apply. All right, let's come down the home stretch here. Again, I'll remind you that 7-10 on Friday evening, the Twins will play the Nationals at Target Field. Tyler Malley against Trevor Williams. The Nationals come in 5-13, and 13, so 
definitely going to be a series where the Twins want to get a little fat on the hog, so to speak. You can listen to the hometown broadcast, Corey Provis and Danny Gladden on SiriusXM on the SXM app. Just make sure you search the term Twins, like your Minnesota Twins, who will face the Nationals three straight over the weekend and then welcome the Yankees to town. Tyler Malley getting the ball in the opener, as we just noticed. Then Pablo Lopez against Chad Cool and Sonny Gray against Patrick Corbin. If you want to get a look at just the raw numbers of the pitchers the Twins are going to face, we'll pull them up on baseball reference here. The, the rotation, the Nationals rotation, if we're being generous, is dreadful. They have two guys who you really have to think about not wanting to face. Mackenzie Gore, because he's just downright nasty, and Josiah Gray, because he's young and has some good stuff. Those are the two pitchers the Twins aren't going to face in this series. So they'll face Trevor Williams, who has a 3.52 ERA, but doesn't strike anybody out. And um, his, you know, his FIP is 4.63, so he's not he's not dealing by any means. Um, Chad Cool's ERA is 8.59, and Patrick Corbin's is 6.30. So this, again, is a very good chance for the, the Twins to get fat on the hog against a team that just has no interest in winning. And as we noted, too, the, the matchups for the Yankees series, the Twins will see Brito, Cortez, and Herman again. Um, that Herman could be interesting in the light of the in light of the 10 game suspension handed out to Max Scherzer after he after he was booted out of a game by Phil Cousy. And if Phil Phil Cousy, excuse me, if that name makes you have cold chills as a Twins fan, there's reason for that. Just ask Joe Maurer at Yankee Stadium. But yeah, uh, same same starting matchups for the Twins against the Yankees, with the exception of facing Garrett Cole, since this is a three-game series, instead of four. So Williams, Cool, Corbin, Brito, Cortez, Herman coming up here in the next six games. Let's talk about these Nationals. Um, they're bad. <laughs> they're bad. Uh, like That's what I have written down on the note here. Let's talk about the Nationals. They're bad. They're a young team that the Twins need to take advantage of at this point in the year. Get your offense going. We thought that happened a little bit against Corey Kluber in the uh, Wednesday game of the series, but Twins again retreated back to being a pumpkin in Thursday's in Thursday's game. Um, the Nationals, so the, the, this is their typical lineup. Again, thanks to our friends at Roster Resource. Lane Thomas and Wright, Dominic Smith in, at first, Heimer Candelario at third, that's a former Tiger, if you want to remember him that way. Um, Joey Manessis at DH, Luis Garcia at second, Kiebert Ruiz behind the plate, Stone Garrett in left field, CJ Abrams at short, and Victor Robles in center. Now, the one thing you'll notice with this Nationals team, they start almost the same exact nine guys every single night. The only real difference is that Alex Call will find his way into the lineup every now and then in the outfield at the expense of usually Stone Garrett, but every now and then Victor Robles. Um, but this is a team that is very young, in transition, and you're going to face their three worst starters. You have to, have to, have to do significant damage, not only in terms of in the series, but show that you're progressing towards improving your offense against teams that aren't going to lose a hundred games this year, especially with the Yankees coming to town right after that. Um, the nationals not only are five and 13, they've lost six of their last seven. They had an off day on Thursday. Not that that makes that much big of a difference anyway. And it's a young team. So they don't need those off days as much as older teams in the first place, but they've lost six of their last seven. They're all out of sorts. If you look at their rankings, Across all MLB for offense, they're 14th in average, 19th in on base, 27th in OPS, 30th in homers. Their starting pitchers strike nobody out. Their relievers are run of the mill, and they strike even fewer people out. This looks like a Twins team from about 10 years ago. And right now, that just does not have that much promise. The Twins need to take care of business here. Um, and I suspect they will, especially at Target Field, um, because even last year, amid their struggles, they played much better at Target Field um, 
as noted by Dick Bramer on today's telecast. And by the way, Dick Bramer mentioned he is stepping away from Twitter too. If you have comments on that, I'd love to hear them. But um, a, a fun off color personality um, on Twitter, which is a, is a direct contrast to how Dick carries himself on the air. It's obviously, um, you know, way more businesslike. Uh, but yeah, no, no, Twitter's going to be worse for Dick Bramer not being on it anymore. And, um, you know, I just want to get that out there. We're kind of sad about it. Um, you know, Burt Blylevin's still out there selling stuff on eBay, but Dick Bramer's calling it quits. So, um, you know, no more Bramer on Twitter. Well, that's all I got. We got you to a half hour. So, uh, big show today before we split though, thanks for making us your first listen every day. Also make sure you check out the breathless post game minute and we'll try a few pregame minutes here coming up too and see if people like those um make sure you follow at locked on twins at locked on min for locked on minnesota network and of course at brandon underscore w a r n e that's me on the twitter machine um give us five star review like subscribe all that fun stuff tell people if you enjoy the show tell me if you don't i would again love to make it better for you Thanks for making us your first listen every day. And every dayers, make sure to check back. We will go even deeper in depth on the Nationals and get you into your baseball weekend with Friday's edition of Locked On Twins. Now, this is Brandon Warren signing off saying thank you so much for hanging out with us, and we'll catch you tomorrow.